Last week I uh, started a series, just going to be a two-part series, I'll wrap it up today. But it was prompted by recent legislation that went into effect in Canada um, where conversion therapy became a criminal offense, punishable by two to five years in prison. If you weren't here last week, conversion therapy is any therapy that seeks to reduce, repress, or change homosexual urges or any sort of gender identity that's outside of your biological gender. And, and so basically, um, Canada is legislating against morality. Now, now the reason that um, we're addressing this is not because we believe it's the place of the state to legislate righteousness into existence. We don't believe that. We don't think the state can make us righteous. There's only one thing that can make us righteous, receiving with meekness the implanted word. Jesus Christ saves. The gospel is what converts us. And so we're not here today to put it on the shoulders of the state to convert us, but we're here today to speak truth where our culture is trying to sell a lie. And I'm here to remind all of us today that we have a responsibility as we see our freedoms ebbing away to continue to utilize those freedoms. The reason that we oppose conversion therapy is because when anyone gets saved, then they need to be discipled. And when you disciple them, what do you do? You teach them to obey everything Jesus has commanded. And so if somebody who's struggling with gender identity or same-sex attraction gets saved, we have a responsibility as believers to come alongside them and disciple them. Well, that's now a punishable offense in Canada, discipling the person who's struggling with a particular sin. And so anytime our culture says this portion of our society may not be evangelized, we can't listen. We cannot obey man rather then, God, we have a mandate, but I want you to understand the mandate is to go ye therefore into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Remember this, Jesus promised, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's why we're opposing this, because we're in the business of converting souls. That's what the church is about. That's why we are talking about this. And I want to remind you that what it is that draws people to repentance, it's the kindness of our Lord. Everyone who's ever renounced one sort of lifestyle, whatever it is, whether that's drunkenness or homosexuality or greed or gluttony, whatever sin people leave behind to run towards Jesus, they've done that because they've recognized this. Jesus is better. That's what brings us to that place of repentance. I see the beauty of the risen Lord. I see the beauty of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so I go to him. And I shared with you last week that some people are radically converted and you can see immediately a change in their person, in their demeanor, in their characteristics, in their attitudes. And, and some people, they're, they're converted and you don't see an immediate change, maybe because they're eight years old. But every single one of us, when we are converted, God begins the process of transforming us from the inside out. And I want to start today with sharing you with you another story of radical conversion. This is Jackie Hill Perry. I first heard about Jackie Hill Perry through P4CM. If you guys are familiar with Passion for Christ movement, it's just a, an organization that gets together a lot of poets. Um, and they blow me away with their spoken word poetry. And so I heard her speaking at well, one of these events. I wasn't at the event. I was just watching the video. A and her testimony was amazing. God transformed her. He transferred her from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, her, her story started, her struggle with sin started from a very young age. She said as early as six years old, she struggled with same-sex attraction. And what was interesting is even though she didn't, as a small child, go to church or read the Bible or have anybody in her life telling her that was wrong, she said, I knew it was wrong. I knew it was something to hide from my teachers and from my parents. But she pursued it nonetheless. It wasn't until she was a teenager and she started going to church that she realized what it was called and that it was a sin before God. She felt guilty about it, but she continued to live in it. She continued to pursue it. 
The reason that she went to church is because she had an aunt and a cousin who loved her, and they would bring her along with them to church on Sunday. They, she, they would have her in their home. And they, they knew what she was doing. They knew how she was living. And they didn't approve of her lifestyle, but they loved her. And so when things started to fall apart for her, she went to them. It started with conviction. I love the way that C.S. Lewis describes it. He says, the holy hound dog of heaven was after him. And that's what, that's what happened with Jackie Hill Perry. She got to this point where she was continually convicted. Like she couldn't sleep at night because she was so convicted about her sin. So she called up her cousin. Her cousin's name was Keisha. And she said, I need to talk to you. She got together with Keisha and she started sharing what was happening. And Keisha said, that's God. He's, he's pursuing you. She says, what do I do? She said, you need to repent. She said, I can't do that. I can't leave this. This is, this is who I am. This is my identity. You're asking me to, to leave everything that brings me comfort in the world. And Keisha said this, God's going to show you how much you need him. Jackie had no idea what she was talking about. But soon after that, her father died. And after her father died, her world fell apart. She actually didn't have a close relationship with her father. She was estranged from her father, but sometimes that's the hardest death to experience. She got into a life of, of crime. She was arrested. She was put in jail. And she got out, and her life just continued to spiral downward. And she realized the lifestyle that she was living was going to destroy her. And she continued through that whole time to be convicted. She continued to go to church and hear the gospel. But she continued to, continued to resist God. And she got to this point where she realized she needed to repent, but she just felt like, I can't leave this behind. And she started crying out to Jesus, help me, help me. And she said he did a miracle in her life. He showed her how beautiful he was. She, she describes her transformation this way. I chose Jesus because through the Holy Spirit, I saw that Jesus was better than everything upon the earth. And do you understand? She had to see it that way because she had to leave everything. You get that? Everything had to be left behind. For her to come to Jesus, she had to abandon her entire lifestyle. She had to repent and come to Jesus. After she repented, she was discipled by a woman in the church. And I love the way that she describes her discipleship. She says she, says she was discipled holistically. And what that meant is the woman didn't just focus on this one area of, Im of immorality in her life. She focused on all of it. She said, we're looking at all your junk, Jackie. We're going to talk about everything that you're struggling with, and I'm going to teach you from God's Word how the Holy Spirit equips you to have victory in your life. She had no concept, even though she'd gone to church for years, of what the Holy Spirit does when he regenerates us. She says this, I had no concept that conversion is supernatural. I had no concept that God enables you to live righteously when he regenerates you. The gospel saves us from the penalty and power of sin and makes God's promises possible. I want you to understand this. Jackie is a Christian today. She's a follower of Jesus Christ because she saw how beautiful he was. And then she realized that he had equipped her to live the life he had set her apart for. And that woman who discipled her, that woman who came alongside her, what she did is now illegal in Canada. We have opportunities to make disciples. We have opportunities to be the means that God uses upon this earth to rescue people from the kingdom of darkness. But I think that oftentimes the reason we don't do that is because we don't even understand who we are. And so last week I challenged you. I said, if we're going to oppose conversion therapy, then we need to understand what it means to be converted by the power of God. We need to understand who we are in Christ. And so that's really what I want to do. I want to remind us as the church of who we are. But let me start this week in Ephesians 5, verse 8. I want to remind you who we are. For you... Where once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. You see what he says? This is who you 
were. This is who you are. Do you comprehend that? Something happened when you got saved. Something changed. You're not who you once were. You are something else. And I want you to get this. You're something different entirely. Light and darkness cannot coexist. They're not the same thing. They cannot cohabitate. It doesn't work. You turn on the lights, what happens to the darkness? You don't have some like dark spot that stays in the room floating in there anymore. No. What are you? Light in the Lord. That's you. Live like it. That's the challenge. The challenge is for us to live in the identity that God has given us in Jesus Christ. We have been converted by the power of God, but we don't fully comprehend what he has rescued us from, and what he has delivered us to. See, this is, this is why we oppose legislation that says we can't go to the new convert and say, God also equips you to have victory over that sin. We can't go to the new convert and say, you're not darkness anymore. You're light in the Lord. Why would any nation legislate to eradicate the greatest news in history. Well, this has been happening since the church began. And the answer is in John chapter 3, verse 19. Jesus told us this would happen. Why? John 3, 19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. Why do they do this? Because they do not want their deeds exposed. Because they love darkness. Every human has to answer this question. What do you love? What do you love? Do you love darkness or do you love light? Because I want you to understand this. If you love light, then you're fine with your deeds being exposed. Because you've been converted by the power of God. And those deeds are not who you are. They're your failures. They're your past. You see, for the believer... Sin is always in the past. Why? Because we're always running towards Jesus and repenting and moving on. It's no longer who I am. I have been converted. I'm no longer darkness. I am light in the Lord. Do you love darkness or do you love light? Do you oppose legislation that is for immorality because you love light? Are you living in the light? Are you living a life that runs toward Jesus, or are you living a life that runs away from him? Because of all, all of humanity is divided in only two categories, sheep and goats, the saved and the unsaved. And the unsaved will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is where we started last week, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males. No thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. He says it at the beginning and the end. This list, these are the people who will not inherit God's kingdom. Do not be deceived. And why does he say do not be deceived? Because of chapter 5. What has he just now addressed in chapter 5? Somebody is attending your church and living in sin. He's sleeping with his stepmother, and you're approving of it. You're putting up with that in your church. You can't do that. Now, it's so important that we make a distinction. Because in 2 Corinthians, what does he say? He says, restore that one. Restore him. Why? Because he repented. See, there's a difference here between somebody who's living in unrepentant sin and the Christian who struggles. Because here's the deal. I think every single one of us can find ourselves in this list. And that doesn't mean that we're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. What he's talking about is people who, live, who are living complacently in these sins, who are living complicitly with these sins. What he's talking about is people who don't care. What he's talking about is people who describe their identity in terms of these sins. That's just who I am. That's unacceptable. Why? Because as believers, we repent. We practice repentance. We turn away. 
to the world, they just try to cover over their shame. If you come to a Christian who's trying to cover over his shame instead of repenting of his sins, that Christian is in danger. And, and I've seen this happen, having spent my whole life in the church. And when I see a sin, what do I do? I've read Matthew 18. I know what to do. I go to my brother. I say, brother, you need to repent. You need to come back. And, and when they say no, they're in this list. Do you understand the difference there? It's so important to distinguish between the struggling Christian and the unrepentant sinner. Do not be deceived. People who continue to practice these sins willfully, defiantly, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But remember, we all used to be like that. We used to all defy God with our sin. We all used to live for that next passing moment of pleasure in sin. That used to be who we were. That's what he says in verse 11. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. This is who you used to be. This is not who you are anymore. And I reminded you, we can still be tempted for all of these sins. We can still be tempted, but your identity is not your temptation. Your identity is not your temptation. Who you are in Christ Jesus is your identity. This is one of the, the struggles for the homosexual, com homosexual community. Because for them, homosexuality isn't something they practice. It's who they are. It's their identity. But, but here's what I found. I found that we do the same thing. We begin to think of our sins as our identity. That's who I am. That particular sin that I struggle with more than any other, that's me. That's who I am. No, it's not. It's been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Come to understand who you are in Christ Jesus. You are not your temptation. You are not the sum of your past mistakes. You've been transformed by the power of God. Now, it's so important that you get this. We work because we have been transformed, not in order to be transformed. Do you understand the difference? I work because I have been transformed. I work because that's who I am. I don't work to become that person. Do you understand the difference? Because that's what sets us apart. That's why being a Christian is different than any other belief system or worldview the earth over. Because we believe this, I have been transformed by the power of God. But I'm in process. I'm learning to live in the fullness of that identity. I'm learning to live in the fullness of who I am in Jesus Christ. I'm not working for transformation. I'm working because I have been transformed. What I shared with you last week that I see in this verse right here is that every believer has been converted into a temple of the Holy Spirit by the power of God. Every believer has been converted into a temple of the Holy Spirit by the power of God. And I told you that there are three actions that God performed at our conversion to make us new. Last week, I talked with you about the first one. We talked about how he washed us. And if you weren't here last week, you want to check that out. You can see it on, on YouTube or on our Facebook. He washed us. And what that means is he regenerates us. He renews us. He heals our evil conscience. We now have a, a good conscience. The, the second thing we see in this passage is that he sanctified us. That word sanctify, literally, it means to set apart. What we see it means in Scripture is that we're set apart for a holy task that God has before ordained for us. God has works for us, and he set us apart for those. Central to our understanding of sanctification is this reality that I am not my own. When I go to Jesus, I give up everything for the joy of having that one treasure. He sanctified us. Peter describes it this way in 1 Peter 1. Um, actually, this is not 1 Peter. I changed my notes. We're going to jump to Hebrews 10.10. <laughs> Hebrews 10.10. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The first thing I want you to understand about sanctification is it's once for all. 
Look at verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now, unfortunately, the Christian Standard Bible right here does not translate this participle with the word being, but that's how you translate a part, participle. Why? Because it's continuous. It's present continuous. So the CSB is not a good translation here. If you look at any other translation, they have the word being right there. So the second thing I want you to understand about sanctification is it's a process. So first thing, it's completed. Second thing, it's a process. Wait a second. How does that work? Well, in verse 10, the, the, the verb here for sanctified is in the perfect. And in the Greek, the perfect is a completed action with present effects. God is complete. It was finished at the cross. You were sanctified the moment you confess Jesus as Lord. You're set apart. You're perfected. That's what he says at the start of verse 14. But you're being sanctified. You're in process. What does that mean? It means you're in process. It means right now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. What's going to happen when we see him? We're going to be like him because we're going to see him like he is. And what's happening right now? We're being transformed from glory to glory. I'm comprehending more and more and more who I am. I'm trying to lay a hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also already laid a hold of me. I don't quite get it yet. I don't understand fully my identity in Jesus Christ, but I'm trying. I'm pressing on. I want to get it. I want to know who I am in Jesus Christ. I want him to reveal to me my true identity because I know I don't get it. I don't even know my name. Do you know that? We don't even know our names. You get to heaven, he gives us a stone. It's your name on it. You'll find out what your name is someday. Not yet. There's so much for us to know. That's the process. That coming to comprehend who we are in Christ Jesus. And then here's the means. Let's go on in the passage. Verse 15. The Holy Spirit also testified to us about this. For after he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, the Lord says, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sins. What is that? That's the new covenant. It's God's promise to his new covenant people. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my law on your mind and on your heart. What does that mean? That means that when you're sanctified, when you're set apart for his holy purpose, he puts in your head what you're supposed to do. That's why you have those moments in your life where you're like, oh, I got to do this. I got to talk to that person. I got to go share the gospel. I got to change this about my life. And praise God, he doesn't just put it in our heads. Because then we would go crazy. Puts in our heart. What does that mean? He works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. He's working on our desire. As I struggle to want to do what I'm supposed to do, God says, I'll help you with that. It's part of his new covenant promise. That's what he's doing as he's working this sanctification out in my life. As I'm coming to comprehend who I am. I'm even coming to comprehend this. I don't even know what I want because I know his law is on my heart. I know what I want is what he wants, but I need his help as I work out my salvation with fear and trembling to even comprehend my new desires, my new nature, who I am in Jesus Christ. This is a process. I, I wanted to summarize sanctification sort of succinctly for you. So I want to explain to you uh, just in one sentence how sanctification works how it's worked out in the life of the believer. Sanctification is realized in our lives through continual dependence upon God to help us live out by His Spirit the transformation He has already wrought in us. One of the things that's so confusing is when we read about sanctification in Scripture, sometimes it's past tense, sometimes it's, it's present. Well, which one is it? Am I sanctified or am I being sanctified? Yes! God's done His part. I don't get it yet. What do I need to do? Depend on him, not myself. Depend on him, not myself. Because, see, I have this problem. I'm weak. I'm weak. I don't have the strength. I don't have the ability. But I believe this lie at times. I can do it. Believe that. That's the problem. When I start thinking, I can do it. I can figure it out. I can get there. I can muscle through to Christianity. I can self-help myself to Jesus. I can't. You understand that self-control is the fruit of the Spirit. You get that? 
Self-control, fruit of the Spirit. What's that mean? It's not you. It's Him. You having, contr- you have, having trouble controlling yourself? Stop trying to control yourself and start letting Jesus control you. Your problem is that you think you're yours. You don't belong to you. You have been purchased. You have been sanctified. Your body is an instrument. And you have a choice to make. You can take that instrument and you can present it to sin. Or you can present it to righteousness. Our problem is we often choose sin. And that's why Paul exhorts us in Romans 6 verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourself to God and all the parts of yourself to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is what it means to be sanctified. It means I recognize my body is an instrument and it's not my instrument. It's not mine to use. And so what I do is I say, God, this is yours. You you take it. You take over. Here I am. Use my body, living sacrifice for your glory, for your kingdom, for your renown, for your pleasure. My life is not my own. That's what it means to be sanctified. It means to recognize your body is not your own. You offer it to God. This belongs to you. And the reason you can do that is because that's your new identity. You don't offer yourself as an instrument to righteousness and that's some some foreign entity. No, that's who you are. That's what you do. Why? Because you've been set free from sin and you've been enslaved to God. What am I talking about? Well, I'm just quoting scripture. Look at verse 22. That's what he says. But now having been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit which results in sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. I've been set free in order to serve. Look what he says is completed right here. Two things have been completed. You have been set free from sin. Past perfect. I have been set free from sin. Past completed action. Present effect. I have been enslaved to God. Past completed action. Present effect. And the sanctification of that, the result, the fruit of that is my sanctification. Sanctification comes about when I begin to recognize I died to sin. I am free from sin. I'm a slave of God. That's who I am. Sanctification is a process of me getting that. See, see our problem, I love the way Paul Tripp describes it. He says we have gospel amnesia. We wake up and we forget, wait, who am I? Who am I living for? What is this life all about? Every day, maybe every hour, we have gospel amnesia. We're coming to comprehend, oh yes, this is who I am. This is my new identity. This is who I am in Christ Jesus. And recognizing that, the fruit of that is your sanctification. The fruit of recognizing that is your sanctification. Now, you've heard me using a phrase that you are not your own. I didn't make that up. I got it from Paul in the passage we're looking at, 1 Corinthians 6. So let's go there, end of the passage. Paul says this. This is is how our sanctification is realized in our life. He says this in verse 18, flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Did you hear that? Let me repeat it. You are not your own. Why? For you were bought at a price. So glorify God with your body. Your body does not belong to you. Why? You've been purchased. You've been redeemed. You are not your own. Sexual immorality is a sin against my body. And here's the problem. It's not my body. It doesn't belong to me. Why do we struggle with sexual sin? Because we think we belong to ourselves. We think that's my right. We think that we have the freedom. No, I don't. 
I've been purchased. My body doesn't belong to me. That means my sexuality doesn't belong to me. That's good news because I make a mess of it. I need God to take over. And here's what I love. He tells us how to resist that sexual temptation. What does he say? What's the answer? Flee. Run away. Might not sound like a good battle plan. It is when it comes to spiritual warfare. Be, be a Joseph, not a David. You understand what I'm saying? Be a Joseph. What's Joseph do? Potiphar's wife comes after him. What does he do? I'm going to get out of here. I don't care if I leave my robe behind. I'm out of here. I'm going to flee. I'm going to run away. What does David do? He sees sin. He goes towards it. He plants. He makes provision for his flesh. And he fails. You need to understand this. We're either running away from sin and towards Jesus or away from Jesus and towards sin. You can't have both. You can't run towards sin and run towards Jesus. You can't be making provision for your flesh. You can't be thinking in your mind right now about how you're going to sin later on today and how you're going to get away with it and say, I'm living for Jesus. I'm pursuing Jesus while making provision for the flesh, while I'm setting the table to sin later on. No, what, what do Christians do? They repent. They still sin, but they repent. We flee. We run away. Why? Because that's not who I am. It's who I used to be. Because my body isn't my own anymore. It belongs to Jesus. I've been bought at a price. My life is for his glory. It's not for me. Every believer has been converted into a temple of the Holy Spirit by the power of God. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own. You're a temple. God lives with you. God lives in you. Three actions that God performed at our conversion to make us new. First one I talked about last week, he washed us. Second one we talked about just now, he sanctified us. He set us apart for his holy work. Third one, he justified us. What is that word? What, what does that word justification mean? I think it's, it's a really difficult word to translate. And the, the reason is because justified is the verb form of the noun for righteous in the Greek language. In, in our English language, we don't have a verb form of righteous. Think about it. Righteous, that's the noun. What's the verb form of righteous? Righteousized? What does that mean? What, what it means that God justified us, it means God declares us righteous. How can God do that? How can God declare us righteous? Well, let, let's see how well you guys know uh, your basic catechism. You're all Protestants here. You should be able to answer this question. How are we justified? By what? Alone. By blank alone. By faith alone. This is, this is what the entire Reformation hinges on. You guys with me? We're, we're justified by what? By faith. We're justified by faith. Now, now, Luther didn't make that up. Augustine didn't make that up. Paul told us that, and God showed us that in the very first writing of Scripture. From the very beginning, this is how man has been saved. Romans 3.28, for we conclude that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Now, I hope that you're learning what this word faith means. Faith means me depending upon God and not myself. I've given you a definition, abject dependence. Abject because I admit I can do nothing. I am completely unable. I am not equipped. I can't do anything to save myself. I can't do anything to redeem myself. I need you. That's what faith is. It's abject dependence. It's me saying, God, I can't do this. I need you. And I want you to understand this. This is always how people have been saved. It's not, it's not a new invention with Paul. Why? Genesis 15. God is talking to Abraham. He says, look at the stars. So shall your descendants be. What does Abraham do? He believed God. What does Moses tell us? And God counted it to him as righteousness. It was counted. It was credited to his account as 
righteousness. And then Paul goes on in Romans chapter 4, and he says that credited to his account wasn't just for him, but for us also. Listen to Paul. He says this, Now it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus was raised for what? For our justification. See, the reason I can say, I need you, I'm going to depend upon you, is because Jesus has done it. He did it. He did what I couldn't. He lived the perfect life. And now my sins, my trespasses, have been forgiven because of his shed blood on the cross. And I've been justified because he was raised from the dead. But why, why is it important that Jesus was raised from that? See, the resurrection vindicates the righteous life of Jesus Christ. That righteousness is what justifies me. Listen to Paul in Romans 5, 18. He says, So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act there is justification leading to life for everyone. Do you hear that? One righteous act. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about Jesus Christ, his righteousness, my justification. Do you see that in Romans 5.18? Jesus' righteousness. And this is why this is good news. Because I can't measure up. Because I will fall short. Because I cannot merit the forgiveness I've been given. Because I can't come boldly into the throne room. I don't have any merit. I don't have anything that says I, I have a right to be there. The reason I have a right to be there is because of what Jesus did. I didn't merit that right to stand before the Heavenly Father. Jesus did. And now, guess what? I'm united to Him. I'm in union with Him. His life is my life. His righteousness is my righteousness. His merit is my merit. In verse 19, Paul goes on. He says, For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now when Paul says made righteous here in Romans 5, he's using a different phrase than he's used throughout all of the book of Romans. When he says made righteous, the word made right there means appointed to. God has justified you, but he's appointed you to righteousness. What is that talking about? The last word we discussed. Sanctification. We have been justified. We have been sanctified. We have been washed. When? When you were converted. God did that work in your life. And, and here's the thing. Because God has justified you by faith, that faith is going to show up in your work. That, that's what we call sanctification. What's happened on the inside is manifest on the outside. And guess what? It happened in Abraham's life. Do you remember the story? Because Genesis 15 isn't the end of the story. Genesis 15, he believes God. Genesis 22, he obeys God. Do you remember? What's he do? Genesis 22, God says, oh, you know that son, that son of promise, that I've promised you through Isaac all nations will be blessed? Kill him. Abraham, I know you believe me. Abraham, I've counted it to you as righteousness. And now you're going to show the whole world what already happened in Genesis 15 with your actions in Genesis 22. So what does he do? Takes him up on a mountain and obeys God. Does that righteous act save him? No, the righteous acts demonstrate he already was saved. This is why James says this in James 2.21. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The Reformers said it this way, we're saved by faith alone, solo fide, but not a faith that remains alone. If you have faith, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be transformed. Why? Because whom the Lord justified, the Lord sanctified. 
because he has made you into something different altogether. And I want you to understand this. One of the problems that we get to into in Christianity is we try to separate sanctification and justification. You can't do that. Yes, they're different, but they're not separate. What do I mean? Listen to this quote from John MacArthur as he describes sanctification and justification. He says, those two must be distinguished but can never be separated. God does not justify whom he does not sanctify, and he does not sanctify whom he does not justify. Both are essential elements of salvation. God has justified you. He has declared you righteous. And this is why this is good news. Because we have an enemy who's an accuser of the brethren. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to point out to you all of your failures, all of your past mistakes. And it's easy to believe when he's whispering to us the lie that God could not accept us. That it's true. Because where he directs our gaze is to our own merit. And this is why the doctrine of justification by faith alone is so important. This is how we fight that lie. Jesus did it. Jesus finished it. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. He lived a perfect life. His righteous act is credited to my account. I am justified because of his one righteous act. His obedience to the Father is what justifies me, and that's why today I have hope. But understand, you're not just declared righteous. You're enabled to live in that righteousness. That's what sanctification is. You're not your own. You've been transformed. You're something different altogether. And there's a tension here. Because I, I sometimes don't feel like I'm who he says I am. I sometimes feel like I'm, I'm darkness. But he says, you were darkness. You are light. So why is it sometimes I feel like I'm darkness? Well, it's because I can still be deceived. It's because I don't fully comprehend who I am in Christ Jesus. That's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Look at that middle phrase right there. As indeed you are. I want you to think about that for a second. He's saying clean out the old leaven because it's already cleaned out. You see it? Clean it out. Get rid of that old leaven. Why? Because that's not who you are. What he's talking about is identity. What he's talking about is who you are in Christ Jesus. Who are you? I don't really know because my life is hidden with God in Christ. I'm a child of God. I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am set apart for His work. You know, we look at the world and as it decays, there's only one solution. Transformation by the power of God. And it starts with my heart. It starts with my life. It doesn't start with me going out into the world and trying to reform people from the outside in. It starts with the people in the church getting on their knees and repenting of their sins. And saying, God, I have not been living out of the identity that you have called into existence when you created something new. God doesn't dress us up in new clothes. He makes us into something differently entirely. We're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And what I want to challenge you to do today is to live in light of that new identity. God has works that he's before ordained for you to walk in. I want you to commit today to living the holy life made possible for you in Christ.